Hello, hello, hello. How are you? How's your mom? It's uh, 7.30 in the morning, actually 7.36 in the morning, New York time, Tuesday, March 31st, the last day of the month, the last day of the quarter, 2015. My name is Wayne McDonald. I'm the Chief FX Market Strategist for TradersWay.com. Thank you for being a client. Today we'll cover Forex, Energies, Metals, Indices, Binary Options, anything we can cover, TradersWay.com offers you. Your way at TradersWay with Traders Wayne. So yeah, we're going to do some technical analysis. We covered uh, quite a few pairs yesterday. I'm going to continue, um, specifically looking for swing trades and resumptions of trend. Now hopefully, based on our conversations last week, You've been setting up potential reversal zones and looking for reversal patterns and witnessing the birth of new trends. Have you been doing that? If so, it's probably been pretty exciting. It's amazing what happens to your trading when you think ahead and plan ahead, right? Now remember, trading and investing is business, in particular with leverage. It can work for you or it can work against you. Your past performance or bad never predicts future results. So always stay small and humble. Focus on the long term. Never risk money you cannot afford to lose. <clears throat> I was just burning through a bunch of charts, and uh, apparently I'd left a note for myself on this one. Uh, what direction? <laughs> wow. Hard one to trade, though. Look at the size of this pullback. This is Kiwi Yen daily. All the way down to the monthly M1. Yeah, very interesting stuff. But generally speaking, you can see the strategy of buying the dip. Zoom in a little closer. This is a daily chart, right? So now uh, zoom in a little closer. And we got some room to the downside according to the oscillator testing 55, which means it's slowing down. But it'd be, it'd be interesting if it started to head up soon, and that would be very interesting. One of the things I'd be looking at here is a little fib here. The other thing is if the moving averages are important, we wouldn't want to be any lower than the 55. Okay. But we're not really trending up that well. We have a higher high, higher low, higher high, higher low. So that's another reason, you know, head up up to this area this week. Then I'd like to see that like now. Okay, here's the same thing on a different point of view. Okay, retest the trend line. Okay, notice how that just puts us right back to the top. That's fine by me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's do a quick round the world. Around the world, around the world. So we're 48 hours away from my binary options expiring. We put a, put down an eight-day binary option short position, and you can see it right in here. So 48 hours to go, and uh, we sort, shorted at uh, basically 2,000, sorry, 1,200, and we dropped to an 80. So we're twenty dollars in profit. Very nice. He's the best to go to trade in the whole village. So we'll see what happens here. To me, it's just a resumption of trend. You know, uh, you can see we're in a reverse fib area. If I was a bull, I'd I might be interested, sort of, in this area. So 
So terrible place to short. If you're going to sell it, sell it high. That's definitely middle of the range. In fact, that's 50%. <laughs> uh, that could be uh, middle of the range, right? <clears throat> so I'd like to see gold back down to that zone. But, you know, again, if it's going to head up, that's where I'd pretty seriously start considering buying it. If I was a bull, that's what I'd be doing right now. I'd be preparing to buy that. Cool. Now, if I was a bear, you know, you'd sell out of this resistance zone. Oh, wait, that is where I sold. Wasn't the world's greatest entry. But so far, effective, right? Okay, let's catch up on oil. I want to see this down, as you know. I'm actually quite surprised it made it to 52 or 53. There was no way I saw that coming. Um, but we've made it down through the, the trend here, which I think technically should be interesting, right? If it was so gosh darn bullish, it could have up here, here, or here, but it didn't. If they uh, get their um, peace deal or their nuclear deal out of Iran and, and start allowing Iran to put oil on the open market, um, that should bring oil prices down even further, don't you stink? Meanwhile, I expect the dollar to continue to be strong. Both of these things have the potential of bringing oil down, so I'm still bearish. Okay. Uh, that, but again, this pullback that we had, much, 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 much farther than I would have thought. So, um, yeah, these old zones here, which we're actually approaching, you know, I'm wondering if we're going to get caught in, in a range. Because if this was trending down, it should have fallen at the 3A2, 50% or 618. Or even, even your Alamo is a 786. That did 100% retrace, exactly 100%. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking that the, the greatest potential here is to have this go back down to 44. Okay, or maybe 42. Okay, so basically the zone. Green meaning up, right? Next, stock market, okay. Uh, I said yesterday I expected it to go up. Uh, it went up yesterday. Um, the logic here is there's a prevailing trend. Everyone that needed to get out before the end of the quarter um, for, you know, just normal things, right? What have we been talking about the last several quarters? It's not people panicking at the end of the quarter. It's rebalancing of portfolios. So if you're a portfolio manager and you like to say, you know, you don't like to have more than 5% of, of your portfolio in, in any one given stock, but one stock has gone up uh, significantly and you've had a couple that have fallen significantly, well, now your percentages are out of balance. So maybe you cut some of your losers and you thin some of your winners to rebalance and get you know get the right percentages again. So you get out of some things and, and get you get back into some others, right? So it just tends to happen at the end of the quarter when you when you're required to report. Plus we got earnings season coming up again, right? So you know we have some a down period and then you know I don't know. I, I think this should continue up from here as um, see not only do you need to rebalance if you're a portfolio manager, you don't necessarily want to be stuck with cash, right? And what about kurtosis, Nuno? You got to watch the fat tails. So, anyways, um, yeah, you know. So, anyways. You don't want to be in cash because then your clients call you and say, well, hey, good job. You've been doing really well, but since you're in cash, why don't you give me my money back? <laughs> right? 
right? So anyways, uh, so anyways, I, I'd like to see this uh, end on a high note, okay? Yesterday, we basically said uh, it had to go up, um, not because it, you know, let's say mechanically has to go up, but because going any lower would be very bad. So anyways, let's see, maybe it'll come down, maybe a few more people scale out of some things. So I wouldn't be shocked, how about this? Here, here's a wild and great predicament. We start lower and end higher. So the, the Dow drops um, 85 points and then ends the day higher. Right? Because what happens? Think about it, and then I'll move on. What about those that need to get out of stocks because they need to rebalance, and they're also worried about earnings season coming up? They cut some of their losers, but more importantly, they cut some of their winners. So what happens to the stock of, of good companies if a whole bunch of mutual funds cut the stock at the end of the quarter? Because the company was too profitable and their percentages uh, grew outside the, um, the disclosure document. What happens to these companies, guys? The price. If a bunch of mutual funds cut, a, let's say, one successful company at the end of the quarter. What happens to price? Wow, just me and Nuno, huh? Hey, Nuno. <laughs> Guess we got a private one-on-one -on -one going. Yeah, okay, it falls. But what about the tr the investors that were not in the in that stock, but watched it skyrocket last quarter? What do you think they want to do? Yeah, they buy the dip. Now, the other company might not buy it because they might already have 5%. So they've cut their holdings from 7% down to 5%. Stock falls for a few days, and then other buyers come in and buy it up because they missed out on the first time. These quarterly numbers are important. I'll give you an example, uh, Tesla today announced that they have some product, some new product, and it's not a car, and they're going to tell us about it at the end of April. Why would they do that today? Why would that be leaked out? It's a highly watched company. It was one of these, you know, both stocks. But why today? Because the stock price day is to be used in a lot of modeling. It's going to be used in annual reports and quarter well, obviously quarterly reports. It's going to go into the uh, analysis that hits mutual funds if they decide, hey, they got some cash from rebalancing. Now they got too much cash, they got to buy some stock, so their analysts give them a bunch of stock, and they say, oh, look, Tesla was up sharply. Yeah, but, you know, they announced today, today, the last day of the quarter, not, you know, five days ago or two weeks ago, they announced today that in 30 days, they're going to tell us something new. Because they know, hey, look, if they can get the stock to go up on speculation, if they can get it to jump, you know, another dollar or two, a percentage or two, it's going to look good because it's going to be in the books. <laughs> it's funny. So obviously it's important, right? So anyways, uh, watch the stock market. It could be some nice opportunities. We'll see. Um, let's look at uh, Kitty Cat here. Nice naked chart. I swear. I swear. Um, we identified this this top and bottom, right? This range. 
when we were up here, we just talked about it coming down, back up. Can anybody? Can anybody confirm that? Wasn't like a great detailed plan, but you, I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been trading a long time. If you think about it, hundreds of thousands of hours now. And I'm still fascinated by stuff like that. Like, just it's just so fascinating. So, uh, Camilla Sutton, who is an analyst I like to follow, she's the, the head of, of foreign exchange analysis strategy at Scotiabank. She was on Bloomberg yesterday, right after our session, and she was talking about um, relatively bullish on the Canadian dollar. Not that it's going to get bullish right this second. But uh, they, they have been hammered, obviously, by oil prices. But as long as they don't go down to 20, well, as long as they stabilize and people can, you know, um, the economy can kind of stabilize along with it. And as long as the United States is growing and, and so on and so forth, uh, a lower Canadian dollar is actually good for uh, Canadian exporters, which export almost everything to the United States, right? And the United States is doing well. So she's like, look, all right, we're, we're being crushed by oil prices here, but she doesn't see a collapse in the Canadian dollar going back to, you know, um, like what I said when I was a kid, you know, um, you know, it, it basically the Canadian dollar was half price. Uh, so, she, so she was thinking, you know, by in 2016, let's say a, a, a reasonable recovery that yes, the U.S. dollar will be strong, but the Canadian dollar will be relatively strong versus other currencies. And so, anyways, I thought that was interesting and smart. She, I like her analysis for sure. Who's our AD? I've attended a, a few of her webinars and stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah. But that's what I do, right? Just think of it. She's probably got way too much education, an unbelievable amount of experience, and a staff of analysts crunching numbers for her day and night to make her look smart. I can log into a webinar and she can tell me everything she knows for free. <laughs> Love it! But I guess that's what's happening here, right? You log into a webinar and I say, well, look, I've spent you know the last 20 of the last 24 hours Researching Forex, let me tell you what I know. So I guess it, it, what goes around comes around, right? Pay it back. That means if you're watching this on YouTube, you better, you better leave a like or a comment or you're pretty lame, right? What a lame-o. <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> All right, USD Yen. Yeah, very interesting. Um, by the way, do these pivots, I forget because, um, I don't know, I guess because I've been sitting here so long. Does it, does it all look freaky when I do this? It's just so many lines you can't see it anymore. If so, just let me know and I could always go to a different chart. Okay. But if I was a bear on this one, I would sell here for sure. I'd sell the 120. I'd sell the uh, channel. Um, I'm not a bear, but that doesn't mean you ignore this, right? How do you want to draw this one? I guess let's do it that way. You could do it even farther if you want. I guess that makes sense too. Um, I don't want to see that, but look, clearly a trend line. It's a psych level. It's a pivot point. Okay, and you know, so on and so forth. Look at the oscillator here. Okay. Um, because I'm a bull, I'm still going to play the game, right? Because I'm a player. Um, how should I draw this? I guess I play the game, right? So this is what I got to do here. I'm going to kind of watch this area here for a buy. 
um, and then maybe farther down. Even though they may not be the greatest trades in the world, it's my duty to set up ambushes here. I mean, really, it's my job. Okay. So the first one is a midpoint cycle level of 1950. It's also a 618 Fibonacci retracement between yesterday's low and yesterday's high. Right? You caught that in your analysis? Okay. So, uh, oops. I, uh, oops. If you use the body candles, that's why it's a 618. But anyways. So there's one there. I, I'd be, I, I'd, I'd not be doing my job if I didn't have that as a buy zone. And then my fallback position is going to be down here, 1900, and the monthly central pivot point. Okay. So that's it. But this is what I'm trying to drill home to you guys, right? What's your strategy? Do you know what you're going to do before you even do it? If I ask you, so what do you think of the Aussie? Do you have an intelligent answer? And if you don't have an intelligent answer, that's where you need to be spending your time. Don't worry about, um, don't worry about the charts. Don't worry about what oscillators I'm using, or if you should use an ADX, or if you should get into Elliott Wave. All of that is a complete waste of your time. I hope you hear me. The, the most important thing you need to be doing with your time is open up a, a longer term chart, let's say a four hour or a daily, with any indicator you want. It's not important. Okay, how about like this? You open up a chart like this. And you decide if you're a bull or a bear. Or neutral. If you're neutral, just don't trade it for now. And if you're a bull, identify two or three levels in which you would like to buy. And since, you know, common sense is you shouldn't buy high, you should buy low. So if you're a bull, so where were we here? On the USD yen. Okay, I'm a bull. It's a bearish zone. If I was a bear, I'd be selling this hard and fast and furiously with great vengeance and furious anger. Right? Yes. Why wouldn't you? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Wake up. My gosh. Right? But I'm not a bear. You could be good, but it's the analysis is still the same. Sell it at 120. Do you, you don't have that as a resistance area? Right? Right? I mean, seriously, you're a bear on this, and you're not considering 120.000 as a potential resistance? Why not? You don't think it's a psych level? You don't see a trend here? You're not playing pivots? You're not looking at the oscillator? I mean, come on. Look, you got something going on, or... You're just not a bear and you're not looking for it. And that's probably what is the most likely scenario. Because if you just thought about it for 10 seconds, right, I'm a bear, and you, there's like 900 reasons why that might be a sell zone for you. I don't, I, 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 I think it's going to fall to some degree. I don't want it to on the longer run. So there's my conundrum here. If I'm profitable, I, I probably either need to take profit or move my stop closer, and it's a, a nail-biting area, especially if I'm only in one trade. Now, if I'm in nine trades and only you know, and my stop is below 118 on eight of them, then no big deal, right? But I'm a bull, so it's really simple. My strategy is bullish. I can explain it intelligently to to people on the street if I need to, because half the time I do. Then what? Well, if I'm a bull, where, hey, Wayne, where would you buy? Oh, well, look, I've got multiple reasons why this area I find interesting, right? And if that don't work, what's the next buy zone? Well, I'm going to try again down here. Right? It's not that hard. It's only hard if you don't do the work.
And I'm not telling you to do uh, nine hours worth of work. I'm asking you to open up a day chart, make a decision, right? Or like Mike, flip a coin. Just do something, right? How are you supposed to trade successfully if you don't have a basic strategy like you, you intend to buy or you intend to sell? So why are you denying yourself your success? Okay. So like, okay, I'm a bull. I'd like to buy there or there. Now they might fail. I understand that. So how does that impact my tactics now? Well, when, if or when we get into this area, I'll drop into a smaller time frame. I probably will keep my stop closer. I'll basically scalp my way in, jam my stop fairly quickly, because I think there's a, much, a very reasonable chance we go to the bottom of this channel. Why? Because it's a channel. That's what channels do, right? So if I was a bear here selling, what's my expectation? That's my expectation. We're heading down where? to the bottom of the channel, but I also have to stretch it out time-wise to make sure we get into the pivot profit zone. Why? Because that's what pivots do. Right? That's the target zone if you're a bear. It's also a monthly support pivot, so good enough for the traders I go with, right? So that's what I'd be doing if I was a bear. But I would prefer to be a bull. I know it could fail. I know there's lots of things that can go wrong. But that's why I explain that. Like, hey, I, I just got to play the game. I'm a buyer. I've, I identified a couple of levels of support. I'm not incredibly confident, but I'm going to take a shot. Right? But I'm not a wild and crazy guy. Right? I'm not a cowboy with guns blazing. Those, those are logical areas that I need to at least watch. Agreed? And if I'm watching and I'm ready and I'm expecting little reversal patterns on a five-minute chart and I get them, what do you think my chances are of at least a moderately successful trade? Let's say break even, right? But if I can get a trade where I, I, I have a, a, an opportunity to win, but because I'm buying at support, and I'm watching it closely and, I f and, and I'm watching it intently, which means you know, I might be watching it on a five minute over the course of an hour you know, so I can move my stop and be very, very sensitive to um, in the moment right, or momentum, if you will, then I can get the opportunity almost risk-free. Because I'm right there and I, I'm moving my stop. So I might be risking, let's say, 25 pips. And, but then it gets going and I move my stop and, and then it makes a higher high and then a high, higher low and then it makes a move. So I, so I move my stop closer. And after an hour or two, I got my stop at minus one and I'm done with upside potential unlimited. Job well done. Find the next trade. Okay. Euro USD. What has our strategy been? Yeah. So, what was our strategy yesterday? Yeah. Same thing. Uh, not a lot to say. Uh, I'm wondering where we have this. I'm going to move over to another one because this was one of them that I set up three days in advance, I think. Maybe four days in advance. Yeah, there it is. Do you guys remember we went on these big, long speeches? It's been going up for days, but you have to, uh, uh, you know, confirm your long-term analysis. Are you a bull or a bear? What the fundamentals? 
tell you what's the divergent central banking policy. You know, you got to see the forest from the trees. You know, and then we've talked about this area being you know the birth of of a can you know of a reversal and this was the FOMB mispricing and that traders had thought they were going to raise interest rates in April, which was stupid, but it doesn't matter. Now they're thinking June, which I still disagree with. But, you know, Euro USD goes up, but why? Because the Euro is so strong? Because investors want to capture the negative yield? Or was it just too many people were too long, the US dollar, and they had to rebalance? And then we discussed, well, where would you re-enter the trend? Where would you get short again? Even though Euro USD is up 500 pips, are you a buyer or are you a seller? Well, if you're still a seller, if you're staying calm and intelligent about your scenario, where would you sell? Where's the sell zone? How about the psychological of 110? Right? We talked about that here and here and here and here. We had, it looks like, about a week. To prepare for this, I even drew it out. I guess I got to go to a four hour for this. There we go. Uh, that's not going to work. Uh, my, what, how did I have it? It looked really nice drawn one particular way. There we go. I even drew it out. I have the nice arrow, which means I took time to draw it and everything. I mean, that's hardcore focused, isn't it? Euro USD went up 500 pips, and all we could talk about is, you know, develop, uh, uh, revisit your confidence in your strategy, focus on the fundamentals that create these trends, um, stay calm. It, and understand uh, market sentiment, why th the Euro USD is going up a couple of days before FOMC, and then understanding um, why the market's going the wrong way, per se, um, that it was rebalancing based on unrealistic expectations of a Fed hike. And then so once they <laughs> reprice the, the new expectation for hikes, and, and that, you know, all these things, like, did, did it have any positive impact whatsoever, guys? I mean, this is now, what, 300 pips? And we casually focused on it for days and days and days and days and days. Days before falling. Right? I hope so. I hope it makes a difference, right? Otherwise, it, it seems silly, right? <laughs> we go through it like, what's the point? Well, I hope it. I hope it's making a difference. So yeah, so Marina got it good. Right on. Yeah, a lot, Luis. Huge difference. Hey, well, look, can you, on the YouTube page, can you leave uh, something? Say something? I'd like to know if, you're, if I'm making a difference. Nothing like documenting something, right? So there's the big crazy resistance, right? And down we come. Uh, we had a similar trade on the pound, uh, and uh, I'm up 363 pips on that one. Same turn. Thank you, Ernestus. It hurts to document it. You know, even even to your own psyche. If you just said, Wayne, on this one, I learned this. Like, just document what you learned or what impacted you positively in the video. 
I would say every every single video, because you're not just saying it to me, or or making a public statement, you know, for Trader's Way, but you're actually documenting it to yourself, right? Because now you have to think, well, what did I learn today? And then you have to say, well, how am I going to say that? And then you have to type it in. Um, which is a, phys a physiological thing where you have to remember where the letters are and, and, and type it into the English language. But you're also doing it emotionally because you know um, what if what you know what if you look stupid? What if people laugh at you? You know all these emotions that go through our brain, um, and you're manifesting it. Okay. And so you're actually doing it for yourself, okay? You're actually doing it for yourself because for all, for all you know, I don't exist. I'm an, a, a figment of your imagination, right? <laughs> so do it for yourself. Document. Your, it's like a diary. It's like a trade journal. Um, make it real, not... So anyway, so yeah, look, Euro USD fell. Yeah, that was the whole point, right? And then uh, I got a request for Pig Dog. Happy to do pound dollar. Okay, let's back out a little bit. Okay, do you remember me drawing this now? As you can see, that this is where I shorted. Well played, sir. Well played. Uh, yeah, I had a I order at the fifty percent retracement. Okay, but generally speaking, that was our plan, right? Fifty percent predicts a one three a two, so the actual target is forty three. So we sold at at 51.50 for a target of 43. I know it's only 800 and pip, 800 pips or something, but you know you got to take the little ones too, right? <laughs> now look at this chart, though. Whether it breaks out to the downside or not, if you really step back. Right? If you step back, I think you can retrain yourself the way you look at it. Because if you've gone through a couple of years of struggling with trading, um, as you learn the ropes and stuff, and it's a tough gig. It's a tough gig, man. Yeah. Um, what can happen is you can in inadvertently train yourself that it's complicated. And I'd rather you look at a chart like this and step back and say, all right, this is a lot of time, right? Okay, this is a lot of time, pretty choppy, uh, lots of there. But really, we know uh, this was F40 just before the spike. The market was mispriced uh, on as far as when the Fed was going to raise interest rates. So they're, they were just wrong, okay, and moved sideways. But um, what... Ask yourself, in more simple terms, what's going on here? Is the trend up or is it, is it really that complicated? Or are there patterns here that are quite simple, like down, right? What you create support, lower low. But what do we do on a five-minute chart? Well, after you make a lower low, use the old support as future resistance. Oh, well, look, it came back. Touched old support, became resistance again, and made a lower low. Well, what would you do on a five minute or just do a price action? Take the previous low and you drag that over, and it's the new resistance area for your new short. Oh, look, it came back. It's the same simple way we trade a five minute chart. This is a four hour chart. So, so where do we complicate it? Well, we know there's a lot of trades in here. Um, that, 
or, or let's say there's a lot of movement in here because of the fundamentals. Okay. But we've had a chance to analyze the fundamentals just like everybody else. And we had to decide, do we get back in the direction of the prevailing trend? And the prevailing trend to me seems to be quite down. Right? So do you get in the direction of the prevailing trend? Well, what did the fundamentals tell you? Well, that the Fed is going to raise interest rates, just not in April. So is it June? Is it, is it October? Well, that the market's repricing. So if, if you think it's in June or October or even January or let's say December, June, June, October, and December, I guess it is, um, which one is it? Well, if it's one of them, the dollar's likely to get strong, correct? What do you think? Because you have the same information as me. I don't know. I look at it and say, yes, the Fed's going to raise interest rates. I don't think it's going to be June, but it could be. I think October is possible, but I have said that, I don't know, two years ago. Um, but it could be 2016. It could be. It really could. But it's going to be one of them. And when it does, it'll create dollar strength. Fine. Cool. So down for now, at least, right? So what is the one thing that could make pound dollar go up? I don't think the Bank of England is going to raise interest rates, so let's not even say that. Like, the BOE is not going to jump in and start jacking up interest rates before the Fed, right? I don't know. Yeah, the IMF. We already talked about that. No, and the good news out of the UK, Danielle. <laughs> no, we already know all those trends, right? Yeah, no, we need the IMF to come in on April 16th and release the uh, World Economic Report and say really good things about the UK. That's the only thing on my radar for quite some time. Yeah, the elections and stuff, maybe. But, you know, I think investors, traders, sorry, I think traders make too much out of that because they don't set interest rates. They, they don't uh, adjust money supply. The government is on the fiscal side, and generally speaking, all they do is screw things up. Right? What, you think Obama turned the U.S. economy around? <laughs> hey, I'm Canadian, man. I can pick on U.S. Pol politicians all I want. I don't have a party. But you are, like, let's say now you're just an intellectual. All right, good. You think Obama turned the U.S. economy around? Why? Because Geithner, under his tutelage, saved us? Saved capitalism? No. I mean, where? If anything, it was a massive screw-up on epic proportions. Now, I think a Republican president would have been just as bad. But screw-up on epic proportions, and if anything is hampered, the U.S. recovery, it was government. we got to thank the Fed on this one. In, in fact, coordinated response. So Bernanke got on the phone and called central banks around the world. Do you remember when they came in and announced? Um, I remember it was, it was the ECB the Fed, the Bank of Canada, Reserve Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, um, maybe it was Bank of Japan as well, and they all did it, uh, the same action at exactly the same time. Uh, and I think probably the only time in history where you got five or six of the major central banks in the world all did a coordinated action. Like just amazing stuff. But it's certainly certainly wasn't the government. The only thing the government did that worked was cash for clunkers. 
And then they're like, let, let, let's get a car czar because it, it rhymes. <laughs> right? So anyways, uh, a, a new government in the UK? All right, sounds like fun. Let's have an election. Sounds like fun. Is it going to like change the, the, the value of the British pound? I'm pretty skeptical about that. Okay, right now, the most powerful Englishman in the world is a Canadian, and that's Carney. Oh, so why is the target 143? It's just Fibonacci. Remember, I don't have an opinion. That's just what Fibonacci says. Now, I could overlap that with pivots and change that, and this, that, and the other thing, but all I'm showing you here is if you're going to, let's say, if you're going to use the 50% where I shorted, now, some people might not use that because it's all wick. I just happen to pick the wick. But let's say you use the wick. It's a 50% Fibonacci retracement, which predicts really somewhere between the 1382 and 1618. So, you, I mean, you, you could do that. But as you can see, I have this as a red zone as well for maybe an entirely different reason. Um, yeah, I'm picking this wick here, okay? Okay, you see that? So I'm bringing that across. And that's how I come up with that. Okay, eyeballing it. Okay, eyeballing it. And then once we get down there, I'll make further decisions, right? But I, I'm a type of trader that I pick my zones. I, I pick my ambush, but because I don't control price, I can't push the market around. I can only pick sort of the place, but not the time or the price. So I'm not really in control of these things. But I can tell you, if I'm a bear, I'm going to sell high. Well, sell where? I don't know. Let's look at 50 retracements. Let's look at pivot reversal zones and clusters of weekly and monthlies, um, psych levels, trend lines. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm going to look for a confluence of reasons and then set up two or three areas, right? Plan A, plan B, plan C. What's plan D? Get the hell out of the way. Stop losing money, right? Um, oh, actually, this one here, Jen, I took in class. I did that with you guys. Uh, what made you decide it? Oh, like like I said, I okay. Like I said, I'll do it again. Just I, I don't mind repeating. Okay, this is this green area is actually like gray on gray. Okay, I use this as old support. And I do this over, I, I do this a hundred million times, Jenny. A hundred million times. And I'm not joking, because I'll do it on a one-minute chart, five-minute chart, 15-minute chart, hourly chart, four-hour chart, daily chart. Just I'm constantly doing this over and over and over again. It's called price action. This support is my future resistance. So right there, I just go, boop, that's where I'd want to sell. But then also, then I'm going to measure the high to the low, and I'm going to look for Fibonacci retracements. My sweet spot is somewhere between the 3A2 and 618 Fibonacci retracement. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to look at things like psychological levels. You, you'll see that uh, 150 was a 3A2, and I think I had a trade here that lost money. And the other one was 150, 150 because it was a 50, uh, the midpoint cycle level, 50%, so on and so forth. So I think I had plan A and plan B. 
So, you know, one there and one there. Next. Okay, the, the, what people miss is the fact that this thing's dropped thousands and thousands of pips. So, like, selling at resistance, that's all it is, right, Jenny? Where's the resistance? Well, there's one here. Right? Bring that up to a 3A2. And where's the other one? Here. So anywhere between those two red lines, I'm a bear, I'm going to sell hard. I'm aggressive. Okay? And that's why I also use moving average. Right? So basically it sold off the 21 because at that time the 21 was high. But, you know, it's just like that part should be just easy. I mean, really. Sell somewhere between the 3A2 and 618 Fibonacci retrace, uh, retracement. Look for um, price action resistance. Overlap that with psych levels. If you got pivots, throw in some pivots. But, I mean, complicated part, selling in a downtrend. Right? So that's what I'm trying to say. It, it, you can add as many layers as you want. And it's not always that necessary. The hardest, most difficult thing here, guys, is telling me you're a bear. Well, it's fallen every day for almost a year now. For 10 months, it's fallen. So I sold and made money. Really? <laughs> right? I mean, that's the stupid part, right? It's fallen almost on a daily basis for 10 months in a row. So I sold it and made money. Huh. So that all, So the hard part is you look at that and you say, okay, I'm a bear. Now, you remember around 150, I was hoping it would turn bullish. Oh, well. Okay. It, it went up several hundred pips, but then came down. Oh, you know, well, you know, it was a psych level. I was open-minded to it. That's why now we're thinking, well, maybe it'll have a chance around the IMF. So anyways, once it made the lower low, though, which it did pre-FOMC, I, I have to be a bear. I mean, it's just made a lower low. You can't be a bull. So I'm a bear. So the only question that's left, where would you sell? Throw in the roll reversal, throw in the fibs, throw in the psych level. It's pretty simple, right? I see, Jenny. That I don't know. Um, we'll see when we get there, because a lot of things will be in play at the point. Okay, there's obviously lots of variables in the future, but one thing that I like to do then is get as many trades open as possible that have their stops at break even. So, like, if, if you only had one trade open and you're watching it every day move down and you're watching three, four, five, six hundred pips, okay, fine. You, you get really focused and nervous and everything is riding on that one trade. If you move your stop to break even, then you have 100% available margin in your trading account. What I'd rather you do is find another good trade. Just let your winner run. Just let it run forever. Maybe never take profit. Just like you're done. Your only job is to enter properly in the direction of the prevailing trend. If the market's bearish, sell high. That's it. Then your next job is to manage the risk. That means if it goes higher, take the loss. Or as it starts to fall, you move your stop closer, move your stop closer, move your stop closer. After some time, you lock in a tiny little profit, maybe 15 pips, but you might be up 150. You only lock in 15, whatever. Don't worry about it. What do you care? And then go find another trade. Do that. And then find another trade. Then find another trade. Do it again. Find another. Oh, some of them came back, knocked you out. It uh, doesn't matter. Just keep loading the boat, but not at the expense of risk. 
And then you're like, Wayne, well, what do you do? I'm up 800 pips on the pound dollar. And then I'll say, well, how many trades you got open? Well, I got 12 trades open, right? They each have, you know, the worst one has 300 pips. The best one has 800 pips. Good. Now you're a successful currency trader. Is there a point where it becomes oversold? Well, see, this is a trick, though, right, Mike? If it's if we're in a bearish trend, it's oversold because everybody's selling it. Why would you get it out if every, everyone's selling it? Okay? So the trickier part, obviously, is when do you get out? Well, you can do all kinds of things in the beginning um, to make this easier because newer traders tend to make a lot of mistakes, uh, and a lot of it has to do with not just entering a good trade, but then managing the trade. So I would rather you do things like uh, on a Saturday when the markets are closed, you log into your trade account and you move, your, let's say your minimal acceptable performance per day is 15 pips on each trade. So at the end of the week, if you were in a trade and made 15 pips per day on each trade, that's 75 pips, right? So you log into your trade account when, and I, I say on Saturday because then you can't freak out and make weird judgment calls. And the market's not moving. In fact, orders aren't going to be entered. So um, what you do is you go in and you move all your stops 75 pips to lock in 75 pips on every trade. Now, some of these trades might have moved 300 pips in a week. It doesn't matter. Just let it run. Lock in 75 pips, so now you know that one trade, every day you made 15 pips. Hopefully, you're in five or six trades over the course of time. Maybe it takes you a month, but you get five or six trades open. They're all up three, four, 500 pips each. You lock in 75 pips per week per trade. Done, so 75 pips on this one, 75 pips on that one, 75 pips on that one, 75 pips on that one. And it's not any extra work. When you're only making 15 to 25 pips per trade, that's a lot of work. Statistically, to make money, that's a lot of work. I'd rather you just let them run, let them run, and then just find another decent trade. Get the trade in. If you're going to sell, sell it high at resistance. When it's overbought, in the direction of your bearish trend, great. Get your stop in. After a while, move your stop to, to break even, let it run for a couple of days, lock in a small profit, and on the weekend, lock in your profit for the week, and then let it run. A week later, you're either knocked out for profit, or you've made another, well, let's say it moved 300 pips, you lock in another 75, and you're just, you're just going to let it run and run and run until you get to an obvious risk area. In which you just say, you know what, I've let this run, I'm up 800 pips, you know, we're at a reversal area, we got a monthly pivot point, uh, we got some risk event coming up, you know, let's say it's an NFP or an FOMC or whatever it is, and you're like, you know what, it's been a good run, I got some risk on the table that I don't like anymore, I'm just going to take my 800 pips, done. But the problem is, guys... The vast majority, and by vast majority, I mean 99.9% .9 of amateur traders just don't even get that concept. They're just not even doing it. They don't know to do it. They're not trying to do it. They don't know how to do it. And they're focused on, um, you know, the, the guru that sold them a DVD for $1,000 that says you can live on 25 pips a day. Yeah, if you have 2,000% leverage. Flip the whole equation around. What do professionals do? Right? They're conservative. They're focused on risk, not reward. They let their winners run, 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 run. Right? So, uh, I think we need to wrap up, but there's a few people in here that were with me last August when I did the big, long speeches on, on never shooting at rabbits, that you got to aim for big game, you got to wait for them. And this had to do with the yens. We were at 101.50. 101.50.
And I beg people, don't try to get 15 or 20 pips. I said, I don't care. Load the boat with as, as many trades as possible, one at a time. You're right. Just like I said, don't take any risk. Just enter one trade, remove the risk, enter another trade, remove risk. And that you should have long almost any. Right? Just, in fact, you should long everything with a yen on the right side. But do it one trade at a time, move your stop to break even so you have no risk, and then find another trade, find another trade. In fact, at that time, I said, don't even try to make money in August. You'll get paid in September, October, November, December. Don't even, don't even worry about it. And somebody asked me, well, what's your target for the USD yen? And this was when we were at 101.50. And I said, I think it's going to go up forever. Right? Forever. That you move your stop to break even and give your USD yen trade to your children as a graduation gift. Assuming your kids are still in diapers. That you put it in your will. So like on your deathbed, you're, come closer to me, son. Come to the light so I can see your face. I have a, a gift for you, my son. <laughs> it's my USD yen trade from, <laughs> from 2014. <laughs> yes, I mean, seriously, this is the stuff that we talk about. But... Retail traders don't do it, and I'm going to try to make a difference. Okay? I'm going to try to make a difference. And, I, I'm, I'm, and I'm speaking to you personally. But you got to listen. you got to take notes. And you got to have intent. And you have to have focus. You have to have discipline. You have to have work ethic. Um, I can't solve the mommy and daddy issues. But if you stick with me, man... I'll do my best to at least push you in the right direction. Once in a while, I'll have to drag you kicking and screaming. But at the end of the day, uh, you're responsible for your success. You're responsible for your family. Uh, not me. Not Trader's Way. You're going to have to do the work. But at least, you know, like I said, if, if you log in every day, I'll, I'll make sure you're going in the right direction. Okay. Yeah, and Mike's still alive, right, Mike? Yeah, well, I can't wait to see what happens, you know, five weeks from now, Mike, and then we'll maybe we'll work on something new. So again, if you're watching on YouTube, um, please uh, leave a comment. Let me know that you care. And in fact, like I said, if it were me, I would document what I learned every single day so that you can manifest your learning inside your own brain and make it a physical thing, right? It's not just electrical, chemical energy. If you can actually manifest it in the real world and give it weight and make it real just by simply typing the keys and, and leaving a comment on YouTube.com. So anyways, peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May our profits be above average. Uh, thank you to Traders Way to make, make, for making this happen. And I'll see you guys tomorrow, 7 a.m. New York time. Cheers.